All right, so I'll take a few minutes to go over uh, this Kahoot. I'm not going to go too much into this because it gets technical and you really can understand them when you put them in context to examples, which I could talk all day about. But I don't think you want to. I got stuff to do. I got to mow the lawn. I don't want to. Anyway, uh, so when you take a look at number one, uh, answers all the above. You can see they advise the president. So you might have your National Security Council there with you helping to make serious decisions about war, the Office of Management and Budget to help you putting together the budget, uh, or <clears throat> the Council of Economic Advisors to help you make sense of uh, like a policy position in order to assess what the immediate and long-term economic impact of you know, whatever that bill is. So that's two, it helps you to create policy. Uh, how is it that we take ideas, uh, put them into law or policy in order to turn them into action, and if I'm saying that right. Uh, but that sort of idea, they're gonna help you to formulate your ideas to turn them into something official so that you can act upon them. And then to assess the political impact as well. If we go to war, like the famous example is just Lyndon B. Johnson uh, in Vietnam. Like he was so worried about what he did in Vietnam, uh, focusing so much. Let me restart that. I'm, I'm petting Pearl's belly right here and I'm losing my focus because she wants to play. Uh, but Lyndon B. Johnson, he was so worried about the political impact of his policy decisions in Vietnam because he was really concerned about how this would impact his domestic policies at home. He was trying to put forth this thing called the Great Society to attempt uh, to eradicate poverty, to get things like the Civil Rights Act passed, to get things like Medicare and Medicaid passed. And he really had to consider the impact of his decisions abroad uh, and what they would mean for him at home. So really, these people are so significant in helping to uh, enact, set, you know, develop the president's agenda. So the first one, uh, we're looking at the NSC, a couple of those positions right there, vice president joins the joint chiefs of staff, who basically it's another position within the government who is that person who works with the chiefs of staff for the different uh, arms of our military in order to bring information directly to the president. He coordinates that. Um, the DNI, which is the Director of National Intelligence. So that's kind of like a Joint Chief of Staff position. But these are some uh, the positions that are dictated by law. So this kind of goes back to that idea the president has a team. Well, when he's working with his National Security Council, you can see he has a group of different people amongst many others that make that up. So on to three, if you walk away with one thing about the Office of Management and Budget is that it plays an integral role in helping the president create the national budget. So I'll just say one thing about this. Going back to our first day, the uh, on like the, the increase in presidential powers, one of the main things is that, that has explained that is the fact that Congress will delegate powers to the president. Well, back in 1920, uh, when our government was just getting bigger and bigger coming out of World War I, uh, Congress realized, or well, we'll just say realized, that the job became too big for them. And they wanted the president's input on how to put the budget together. So they passed a law. And in that law, it also set up the Office of Management and Budget. So the OMB is just one example of Congress delegating power to the president, which has expanded his portfolio, so to speak, of his day-to-day -day responsibilities. And that's where we get one of these councils that the president relies on in order to fulfill a responsibility that Congress delegated to him. So number four, looking at the NSC, coordinates policy among government intelligence agencies. Again, that's the DNI, the Director of National Intelligence. So it's, this is where like, I like to look at things and I just think how cool it is. Like, imagine if you're the president of the United States and like you got, you got the, the guy who coordinates everything with the military sitting right there, right? We have bases all over the world, nuclear weapons all over the world, uh, incredibly brave men and women around the world um, and the greatest military arsenal uh, that mankind has ever seen. 
And then sitting over there, you have the director of national intelligence, who's giving you all the stuff that our spies tell us, right? And you just know all that information. Like, I just want to know what it would feel like to sit there and be told those things by those people as you make decisions to ensure our national security. So uh, just a wealth of information that the president is uh, privy to that really only the most powerful people in the government know. So on to five, uh, this is the Council of Economic Advisors. And look, like this is what I say to some of you who uh, might be like a science person or a math person. This obviously is more for math, but say you're great with numbers. Say you want to become an economist. Say you want to become uh, a statistician, any of these things, right? Like you have one of those brains that goes wherever with numbers. I hate numbers. I mean, I love numbers, just not math. And you also like government. You know, you have this teacher who has radically changed your life. That's me. Just because you looked at my beard, so on and so forth. But in all sincerity, like let's say you want to, you like government and you want to impact people's lives, but you love numbers and you're like, man, what do I do with that? Well, you could be part of the Council of Economic Advisors. You could help to assess policy, uh, figure out what the immediate and long-term cost will be of policies, help to figure out how it is that we best steer our uh, economy going forward, for instance. It's, it's an incredible job that influences so much. So on to six, back to the OMB. This is why this job, again, is really, really big here, because you have all these different federal agencies, everything from, uh, you know, so many that are coming to my head here. I'll just say a few, um, you know, just like the, the uh, Postal Service, which is failing financially. Last couple of years for a number of reasons, uh, that could be the FCC that controls like the stuff over the airwaves. Uh, all these different agencies that, I mean, there's so many of them, social security, like you name it. And they're given money to run, our money, our tax money, but it's appropriated, uh, this whole appropriations process by Congress. Basically, the president's making sure, or his job is to make sure that the money that's appropriated by Congress is being used appropriately, and there's not wasteful spending by our government. Now, Anthony Petrilli, if he's watching this, is laughing about the concept of wasteful spending, like not having wasteful spending by our government. But that's what the OMB's main job that they're supposed to do, um, is to provide oversight, and that's one way. But also it's for federal regulations. We have so many regulations, so many. And they're basically rules that say what businesses can and can't do. So they got to make sure that they're being enforced. They got to make sure that people are following them, all these number of things. And a lot of this helps to set policy. Do we need more regulations, less regulations? Um, it helps to set the budget. Do we want to put more money in these areas? Should we cut in some other areas? So the OMB is a really big job. Okay, on to seven, uh, guys, the president dealing with foreign threats such as ISIS and Russia, you're looking at National Security Council, again, war related. Number eight, the executive branch of the Congressional Budget Office. So here's where, uh, like, I don't expect you know what the CBO is, Congressional Budget Office, but budget, right? OMB helps to make the budget. So this is where you see checks and balances, uh, separation, well, not separation of powers, but checks and balances really here. Congress delegated that ability to the president to be able to uh, make uh, the budget, or not make the budget, but give a budget, and then Congress can decide what to do with it. But just like Congress, excuse me, just like the president has the OMB, Congress has a CBO. And they both, yeah, I just said both. They both do very similar things in terms of putting together the congressional budget for the year versus the executive budget for the year. And they'll go back and forth and ultimately power the purse belongs to the House. Uh, and Congress is the one who has the ability to allocate and appropriate funds. But you see that checks and balances, that back and forth that you get from the two branches working together to figure out our budget for the year, because ultimately the president needs to sign the budget just like any other piece of law. And then finally, the OMB, 
uh, excuse me, is your biggest one. Um, because of the amount of time that it takes to enforce regulations, to put the budget together, to ensure oversight of the different executive agencies. So I'm going to finish there. Uh, thanks for listening. If you watch this and finish up with an exit ticket, letting me know what you think about the topic. Have a great day, guys.